Welcome, welcome, friends, to this week's edition of The Lindsay Elmore Show. Today, we are tackling one of the biggest problems facing women, lack of self-acceptance. First up, I am going to be talking with Virgie Tovar. She is the author of The Self-Love Revolution, and you have the right to remain fat. These two books help us uncover our unconscious biases against fat people and help us to accept the body that we are in, no matter the size. Then I'll talk with one of my best friends in the entire world, Dr. Komal Pandya, about how she learned to accept herself and defied her family's expectations while still maintaining an excellent relationship with them. Finally, we'll speak with Dana Mott about how people with textured hair can care for it without harsh chemicals that are so often found in products marketed to African Americans. Thank you so much for listening to The Lindsay Elmore Show. If you like it, please share it with your friends and let us know what additional topics you would like us to tackle by sending a suggestion over to www.lindsayelmore.com slash podcast. I can't wait to hear from you. Now, let's go on and let's get to the show. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Hey there, podcast listeners. On this week's episode, we are talking all about radical self-acceptance. And our first guest on the pod is Virgie Tovar. I'm so excited to talk to her. She is an author, an activist, and one of the nation's leading experts and lecturers on weight-based discrimination and body image. She is calling us out on a new form of discrimination, not unlike classism or racism. She calls it fat phobia and is a self-professed fat advocate. Instead of simply being seen as human, too often fat people in the media are portrayed as unintelligent, lacking in complexity, lacking sexual desire, or are fetishized. We see fat people on TV consuming excessive calories simply for the shock value. We see further misrepresentations of overweight people who are maniacally losing weight without focusing on any of the internal changes that need to occur to ensure self-love. From research, we know that fat women are paid less than their thin counterparts. Parents subconsciously penalize their children for being overweight, and physicians have been shown to have a strong unconscious bias towards fat people, and this leads to lapses in care. One study showed that a shocking 54% of physicians stated that they were okay with denying care to overweight and obese people. I was so inspired to interview Virgie because she helped me see unconscious biases even in myself that I did not know I had. Her new book, The Self-Love Revolution, Radical Body Positivity for Girls of Color is now available for pre-order. Virgie Tovar, welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show. Hi, thank you. I am so excited to talk to you today. Even, okay, even as I was just scripting the introduction to tell people who you are, I had a really hard time saying the word fat. I think just like some people struggle to say black instead of African-American or say white instead of Caucasian, I struggled with the word fat because it can be so offensive to people. But you have thrown all of that out the window and fully embrace the word fat. Tell us why. Yeah, um, I mean, so I've always been fat. I was somebody who was a fat baby and I was a fat kid and I'm a fat grown up. Um, and so um, growing up, that word, the word fat was used to hurt me. It was used to silence me. It was used to 
um, remind me of what was wrong with me. I mean, it was just a daily part of a pretty nonstop experience of emotional abuse. Um, And so I was really afraid of that word. Um, And I Mm -hmm. think, you know, for a lot of people, they learn that it's either painful or impolite or both. Um, And uh, for me, I use that word, like starting to use that word was part of starting to realize that something was kind of off with the whole Mm -hmm. situation, right? Because Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what, what I was taught was like, okay, something's wrong with your body because it's bigger than other people's and your job is to become a thin person and you do that by eating less and moving more um and and so right like even that concept I began to realize right I'm like well I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing that I've been told are supposed to make me a thin person and none of them are working which is Uh the typical experience um for for everyone who attempts to control their weight generally speaking Mm -hmm. um and 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 sort of like you know, I started to realize maybe something wasn't wrong with me. Maybe there was something wrong with the way people were treating me um, Mm -hmm. and the way that the culture saw my body. And I think that when I, I was able to have that space, I was able to say sort of like, there's nothing wrong with my body. And I think specifically, I started to use the word for a few different methods, like in a few different ways. Um, Like I was introduced to fat activism Mm -hmm. and we just, that word became casual. It was just part of conversing with people who were interested in that political movement. So it became sort of decharged through that. I think we also used the word and in the way that a lot of um, different marginalized people reclaim words, there's a way around sort of like, okay, this word, um, right? So what happens is when you're a fat person, the word fat or like the accurate, somebody being fat phobic, that threat is always in the air. It's always looming right? You Uh know that it's going to happen eventually. You don't know when. And so the threat of it is always looming. And when I, when I use, when I throw out, when I throw down, right? Like the the gauntlet has been thrown. I say it first. Yeah. And, and in that way, I take the power away from whoever might want to be emotionally abusive or controlling. And Uh I put it in the domain of, of my own experience and my own power. Um, so I think that there's a lot of methods behind it, but those are two. Yeah, and you you yeah. even reclaimed the word so much that in your first manifesto, you called it. You have the right to remain fat. And yes. I, I love it because when somebody who is overweight reads the title of your book, I think that that has to be like a, 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 an aha moment of wait, I do? I can just stay the same size? I have a feeling that so many people have never been told that. And so describe the scope of this problem for us. What is fat phobia and how does it manifest in in our daily environment? Yeah, so fat phobia, a lot of people will be surprised to hear, um, is actually a form of discrimination, right? Uh Um, We have this belief that our attitudes toward, our negative attitudes towards higher weight people um, are on the basis of health, right? That we don't have, we don't have a bias. We don't have a, it's not a form of bigotry. We just know that that kind of body is like an unhealthy body, right? That's the belief. Um, Uh But in actuality, um, the way that we treat fat people, it matches all the criteria of many other forms of discrimination, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like an example of of um, an example of how you know when something's a discrimin- like a form of discrimination would be, for instance, if you hold double standards, right? Like two people who are otherwise the same, but you judge one of them really harshly and you judge and you don't judge the other person. So yep. an example of that would be like sweatpants, right? Like how do you feel about somebody who's a plus size person wearing sweatpants out and about? Do you have the same attitude towards a thin person wearing those sweatpants, right? What are your presumptions about where they're headed or what they just did or who they are or what their character is like? Oh, um, wow. And you, and you and you find that there's, and when you kind of go through, I mean, it seems like maybe you're having like uh, the wheels are turning, right? Like I know. when we each, when we each go through, I mean, kind of like, wow, I hadn't 
realize that like I do actually have these I and, and I think the other thing right is like what happens is that higher weight people um are judged more harshly or scrutinized more so we're mm-hmm. just watched more and it yeah. creates kind of an idea and, and there's I mean there's so there's so much to it but to sort of define fat phobia um it's a form of bigotry that says that fat people are inferior and that it is totally um normal to treat people to treat fat people like we're inferior um and the inferiority looks like a lot of different things like it's a moral inferiority right like and and there's a long history of the of why we have that feeling but this idea that this person is less trustworthy right this Mm -hmm. person is has less discipline um they have this they, they have this immoral relationship to food um, and therefore they are a suspect. And, and likewise, there's sort of discrimination on the basis of looks, right? Like this person is just doesn't look as attractive to me. It's just natural, right? I just naturally don't like that, right? right. And, and I mean, what, what's interesting in my own, when I started to do research in this area was finding that there were places in other parts of the world where there was, I mean, you know, it's sort of the, the literal opposite of what we're experiencing where fat people are experience, are seen as the most attractive, like certain specifically in these cultures, it's usually women, but not always. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway. And you know, there, there are these really intensely negative attitudes about thin women. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's fat. And, 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 you know, they interview the people in the community and those cultures and they're like, what do you like about this? And they're like, well, it's just natural. I just, I mean, obviously anybody would understand that somebody who's bigger and softer is is superior and more attractive. And so like those things, that same kind of attitude, and it it really goes to show the way that we are socialized in a lot of Uh ways into what we find appealing and attractive and who's worthy of being in friend and who's worthy of being our date and, and whatnot. The last thing I want to say about fat phobia is it kind of manifests on um, three different levels. So like okay. the intrapersonal level, which is how we feel about ourselves. Okay. Um, and no matter, no matter what size you are, a lot of times we have really negative attitudes about parts of our body that are fat. Um, sure. And then there's the interpersonal, which is sort of like, you know, the dating discrimination, right? Like the way that people um, might avoid being friends with a fat person um, and the way, like it obviously experiences of verbal abuse or, or experiences of interpersonal fat phobia. And the final, the biggest one is the institutional fat yes. phobia, which is like, access to clothing, whether or not I can fit in a chair comfortably on an airplane. And it includes things that I think are people are often surprised to hear, but um, medication isn't tested above a certain weight in general. For sure. um, so, so like, for instance, one of the things that people are really shocked by is like the most not all forms of the morning after pill, but the most popular form of the morning after pill doesn't work after about like a hundred, I think it's 170 pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, And like two thirds of American women are plus size, which means that like, you know, this is a real drug just does not work in a ton of women. Yeah, totally. So it's like these kinds of things are how that, that shows up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you help organizations to understand how they are subtly or overtly discriminating against fat people in the workplace. So how can someone who's never thought of this as an issue help to identify forms of discrimination and how can we show greater respect to people of all sizes in the workplace? I mean, a big one, and I think people, again, I think people don't realize this, but um, so um, so I work with people individually and in groups um, around this issue, like a breaking up with diet culture is kind of how mm-hmm. I refer to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I found when I started working with people, most of them are women, um, I, they were, I was like, okay, where are you experiencing the most triggers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I was, I really thought, I was like, oh, it's gonna be family. It's gonna be rom- like dating, right, obviously. And uh, and they said, no, it was neither of those. They said it was the workplace. Um, wow. And they actually, 
and it, and and right like i have a my clients are on a spectrum right there's like i have very petite clients i have larger size clients right um all of them consistently said that the place they experience the most threat fat phobia anger rage sense of disempowerment around this issue was at work and um it was actually the incessant food chatter that happens at often at workplaces right and um so it's like kind of like you know it's not just the weight challenges and things like that which are i mean i mean like the idea of a weight challenge is, is it's such an invasion of privacy it's unimaginable um it's like it's sort of shocking to me at this point to sort of realize that people are still doing it because it's yeah. so blatantly terrible um <laughs> but anyway and like, like i mean and you can just see like the in the hr department like the team of like i know i know let's help our people be more healthy in the workplace by challenging everyone to drop pounds instead of like, let's institute a, a yoga program or like, let's introduce healthier choices in the, in the eat, in the cafeteria, et cetera. But, oh my gosh, yes. I never even thought about what a ridiculous concept that is in the workplace to say, we're all going to band together and lose weight. Like that's not, we're here to work, not, Right, have, right. Yes. No, absolutely. And I mean, I think what's hard is like, and, and right, like, what if work was just work, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's not a yoga program. There's not like a food thing. It's just like, I go to work <laughs> to yes. do my work. And then I get to have privacy as a human, right? Like around yes. how I eat and how I move. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, and we're socialized to see, especially women, are socialized to see weight loss and weight loss conversation as a method of bonding and a method of creating intimacy. Mm. Um, and so it, it's complicated, right? So what happens, but so, so like weight challenges are kind of like on like one example, but like the, the sort of the thing that people focused on when they were telling me the workplace was really hard for them was they were talking about how like they literally can't ever eat a meal without non-stop hearing this is so good oh you're so good oh you're so bad oh how am i gonna what are you gonna have to do to work off that brownie oh my god oh. you're going for a walk <laughs> instead of going to lunch like good for you and just kind of that that sense that you're being watched um yeah. it's very very i mean it's really upsetting to somebody who has an eating disorder background or just really anybody right? it's like anybody it's, yeah it's I mean, yeah yeah even even for people who aren't overweight you don't want to be told not to eat a piece of cake it's not your business and in listening to you talk about this i'd never really considered it but you can actually visualize the stairs as you know happy birthday just got sung the cake's being cut and so and so gets this type of judgment because of the way that they look yeah. and this other person gets this completely other kind of judgment based on the way that they look, even though they are consuming the exact same number of calories for the exact same celebratory reasons, for the exact same social norms that got us to this place of having weird cele personal celebrations in the workplace. Um, <laughs> yes. and it, it's, it, it all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my stars, yes. Why do we have judgments against people in in the workplace and and the thing the thing that i think is so amazing about you is you turned a personal struggle um you write in your first book that you went on your first crash diet when you were still a child and suffered from dizziness and not knowing and 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 all of this is the pursuit of this perfect body image, which does not exist, it caused trauma, it caused difficulties in your life, and you write a lot about family and trauma and addiction. And so how does diet culture affect all of us on an emotional and a, a, a psychological basis? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of people don't realize this but like fat phobia for example is an experience of trauma um when you're somebody who has so deeply and a lot of us have internalized this idea that something is wrong with us that mm -hmm. is a trauma that's a psychic trauma right yes. like you have to teach a child how to feel that way 
children do not mm. feel that way when they're born. No. Um, and so, yeah. And so like we get socialized to, to experience that and it's so widespread that we don't even see it as a trauma, right? Because we have this idea that trauma is something that happens to a small percentage of people and right. trauma looks a very particular way. And it, it's interesting at this point, I, I mean, I'm almost like a decade into this work and I look outside now and I see trauma all around me, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff that's just completely normalized. Like that experience of, you know, like that moment in the office where you're not even able to celebrate someone's birthday without this whole weird thing like happening. Um, that That is, that is essentially, right? Like that's you being triggered, right? The person mm -hmm. is being judged, right? If you say anything to them, they're triggered. They're probably already triggered because they're anticipating judgment. You are like, you are being triggered into a bigotry response if you're the watcher and having that feeling. Yeah. And it's, it's actually horrible to be unable to connect with other human beings because you are so um sort of acclimated to, to creating this is a good person this is a bad person this is a good friend this is a bad potential partner right mm -hmm. um that that dehumanization that happens all the time that is trauma you mm -hmm. know and it happens on such a grand scale but to really kind of bring it down to diet culture um i mean what it really does is that it first of all, it dehumanizes us, right? It's uh -huh. like, okay, I've, I've got to have this kind of body if I'm going to deserve love, respect, and dignity. That's what mm -hmm. diet culture teaches people, right? Like when people come to me and they say, I want to lose weight, I know that what they mean is I want access to love, I want access mm -hmm. to respect, I want access to dignity. Um, oh, wow. Like that's what that means. It, like the weight loss doesn't have any inherent value. It has value because in our culture, we are taught that you will have more access to things that every human being wants and needs if you have this kind of body, right? And then mm -hmm. we've got this system in place that affirms it day after day. It's like, oh, look at that. Like I'm watching my thin friend have six dates a week and I'm not even getting swiped at all on my apps or like mm. I'm going to the shopping mall and like I can't, I can only shop in one store if that, right? So you've got this whole institutional component um, confirming this, essentially yeah. this lie. Um, yeah. So diet culture is first, again, dehumanizing. Um, another mm -hmm. thing that it does is that it co-ops, it steals our relationship to food and movement. Um, and it makes mm. it everything about outcomes. Like food and movement have their own outcomes built in. They're joyful. They're, we know that they like, they make our heart happy. They, we know that when our heart is happy, our physical heart is like actually functioning better, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, all these kinds of things. And so it takes away the inherent joy of movement and food mm. and it turns it into exercise and diet. Um, and that is an enorm that's an enormous crime in and of itself, right? Human mm -hmm. beings were designed to enjoy food, movement, all these kinds of things. Um, and I think, you know, there's, I could just go on and on and on, but like diet culture maps onto all kinds of other things. Diet culture maps onto, and I mean, when I, when I let me like maps onto essentially means like, think of puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. um, diet culture has all of these edges that fit perfectly with things like sexism, right? Like mm -hmm. women are taught that we're inferior and that we need to use, that our bodies are the most important thing that we can use in order to get financial, um, you know, stability and, and mm -hmm. access to love, right? Um, that is, right, like diet culture maps onto that. When you think about racism, right, like diet culture is also a lot about normalizing the white masculine body, right? That mm -hmm. is the ideal. That's the top mm -hmm. of the pyramid for diet culture. It's, so if it you're is literally the statue of David is is how <laughs> yes. we are taught is like this is how everyone looks and it's like no, yes not true <laughs> yes totally but if you're I mean the the further you are from that the more sense of a failure you're likely to feel like um uh -huh. and I mean I can go and then like right and then I the last thing there's so many but like the last thing I want to say is it maps on to classism as well so like you know our preoccupation with people's bodies is highly focused on working class and poor people mm. um all, the rhetoric is all about saying we've got these affluent people they manage to get it together and have the right kind of body and everybody else seems to be failing and everybody else just so happens to be working class and poor people right which is like the majority yes. of the united states so it's like you know it's again this 
diet culture, diet, like fat phobia, all of it is just sort of, I think of it as the newest iteration of us having the historically in the U S this culture, having the same people who are vilified and the same people who are held up as the example. It's the same, it's been the same people for like 200 years, you know, oh it's God. always white. It's always straight white dudes. Right. Yeah, anyway, I know. Right? I know. I loved, I don't know if you heard the cash song that came out around Halloween but the the refrain of it is what if rich white straight men didn't rule the world anymore and I, thought, <laughs> right. and I was like what if rich white straight men didn't rule the world anymore <laughs> I mean yeah. and I realized listening to you how naive I am I mean I, I I'm thinking like but Chrissy Metz is on this is us and this is a great example of a woman who carries around a lot of weight but then to listen to you the whole dang show is her parents being concerned about her eating ice cream, her struggling to maintain a pregnancy because she's overweight, her binge eating in her car, and mm. her breaking up with her boyfriend because he won't support her weight loss journey. The whole show mm. is not about her being a human. It's right. about her being overweight. To, that right. is how she identifies with humanity and yes. you don't until until somebody puts a mirror in your face you just don't see it um mm. and and so okay so how do you respond you mentioned this before but parents get concerned when their kids are overweight um people do have the clear impression that being fat is one of the most unhealthy things that you can do and so what do you say to someone in your workplace who's like girl you really gonna eat that extra piece of cake or how do you train parents who have children that are wearing husky pants which I always thought had to be one of the most insulting things that you could do with a child is tell them that you need this special label how do you teach people to value health but also understanding that being overweight is not necessarily as unhealthy as we perceive it to be in our culture. So I guess one place that I could start is by saying, you know, they've done the research, right? And they've found, they've, I mean, this finding is about women, right? So they have found that, I mean, and again, this, these are like established medical journals. Yeah. Um, these established medical journals have found that the chances of uh, a woman who's classified as overweight or obese becoming a, a normal size um, is less than 1%. It's about 0.8%. Yeah, your um, body is physiologically very, very tuned in to maintaining the weight that you are. Whatever that weight is, it's very good at maintaining that weight. And it actually, when you attempt to lose that weight, your body panics and it changes your fat storage mechanisms. Like it's extraordinarily challenging to lose weight once you have, um, uh, once you are overweight or categorized as overweight. Well, and I mean, I think it's, I mean, a friend of, a friend of mine who's also a psychologist um, gave, and she's an eating disorder specialist as well. One of the things that she, she reframed um, the way we think of body size in this really extraordinary way. She was like, she was like, what people don't understand, right? It's like we, the United States is a place where there's people from all over the world, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that means that people who live here have all different histories. They have different ancestry in terms of like what the bodies of those places look like. In addition to that, they have different histories around access to food, mm -hmm. around experiences of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and she was like, what we need to understand is that two thirds of people in the US likely from what we know about body size, likely come from a lineage where food shortage and food scarcity was part of that history. Mm -hmm. And so their bodies adapted brilliantly to that history. Yes. And about a third of Americans didn't have that particular trauma in their ancestry. So they didn't develop those things. Mm -hmm. And so she said, right, like fat people are just geniuses at being fat, right? <laughs> 
like there there isn't there isn't some kind of right like there there isn't some kind of faulty thing that's going on and this is the thing that's really frustrating to me is and but I believe for so long right like a fat person is not a failed thin person a fat person is just a fat person yes. right like there, you know and so I think there's this idea that. And I mean, I certainly believed it, right? I believed that there was a thin person inside of me. This is like a meme, right? Like everybody has heard this, right? There's like a thin woman inside of us trying to break free or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I think like completely upending that idea. And instead of seeing fat people as failures, seeing fat people as like just totally normal human beings who are just doing what their body is good at. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, there's so many things, I mean, God, I'm thinking about like all these things, right? Like one of the things that's really shocking to people is if we think of our overall health as like a pie chart, okay, um, the slice of the pie that is that is controlled by individuals, right? Like, um, like I feel like this is going to be confusing, but I'm going to back it up. So the slice of the pie that individual behaviors, um, you know, are like, like, mm -hmm. the, yes. yeah, yeah, is thirty percent, uh -huh. um, meaning that seventy percent of the pie are things called social determinants of health, right? They're things that you have no control over. A lot of stuff that happened before you were even 10 years old, right? Yes. Whether or not you experience trauma, that's a huge factor. Whether or not you have access to clean drinking water, whether or not you had access to medical care, whether stuff, I mean, like, we cannot blame people for what happened to them when they were a child. We just sure. can't. No. Not fair. And so um, a lot of people, when they're, when we're looking at the pie chart, they sort of, people don't want to admit that the majority is stuff they don't have control over. People get real, feel really, really terrible when they feel like they don't have complete control over everything. Oh, and so what oh, happened? Amen. I, I see that <laughs> all of the time. I mean, just this past week, a, a, a woman child died from influenza and the internet just attacked her and attacked her and attacked her because did she vaccinate? Did she not? Did she give the drugs? Did she not? Did she this? Did she not? And I'm just like, guys, we have to take a step back and admit the difficult truth that children sometimes die from infectious diseases. That's a difficult thing to say. It sounds harsh. It sounds callous, but there are certain things that are out of our control. You are so right. We don't have control over all of these things. Yeah, and I think for people, what they do is, you know, you give them all this information, they glom on to the one or two things, right? When you look, when you're looking at that pie chart, there are like lots of stuff in that pie chart and spinach and like, whether or not you, there are like two tiny, tiny data points. People yes. are like, oh, the two, the two data points I can perhaps have an, have an influence over. I'm going to blow them up to like 12,000%. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's frustrating to me, but, but yeah. So to get back to when people think of health and longevity and whether or not someone will uh, ultimately acquire, a, you know, I mean, first of all, if we live long enough, we'll ultimately all acquire a chronic disease. We will ultimately all become a disabled person, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a reality. Yeah. Um, but like people often over assign um, individual behaviors to our overall health trajectory, number one. And number two, they over assign importance when it comes to the specifics around food and, and eating and things like that. And the last thing I'm going to say is this is sort of like, again, I think like a real, like a very, large co uh, concept but um what we so we do not have data around i mean in the united states at least we do not have data uh of how fat people would live and whether or not they would acquire anything right like without the bait if, if discrimination weren't a daily part of our lives mm -hmm. um so what we do know is that fat people experience something called minority stress um minor and they've tested this in like very you know queer people and women and um, people of color. Um, and they have found that the experience of discrimination has these extraordinarily negative effects on the body, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to look specifically at, for instance, like something that is really common, um, unfortunately in the black community is low birth weight. Mm -hmm. And they've got, and scientists have gone through and they've looked at all of the potential factors and they reduce it down. And they're like, it's the stress of racism. It's the stress of like living in a sexist, racist culture. 
culture mm -hmm. that is leading to something like this, right? And it might it might seem completely disconnected. It's like how does the experience of stress affect something like whether or not how much a baby weighs, right? The body is extraordinary in that way. Similarly, right, like the way that stress and discrimination and knowing that you are a hated person mm. affects your heart health. It affects and your heart health affects the rest of your body, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're constantly in that stress space, your cardiovascular system is on overdrive all the time. Mm -hmm. Um and and it's interesting, right? Like um I lied. There's one more thing. Like I think about somebody like me who grew up um in a family that came off of alcoholism and dysfunction and you know the research in that arena just just if you grew up in a family where there was a legacy of dysfunction and, and alcoholism they can determine with a fair amount of accuracy how long you'll live how long you know wh what you will die from whether or not you will partner whether or not you will divorce ultimately that's mm. just from that one data point and they don't even look at anything else right and and, and the truth is, right, most people in America came out of that legacy, mm -hmm. um, whether or not we want to admit it, right? But like, yeah. um, so it's, it's just interesting kind of being like, you know, at the end of the day, there are so many factors that go into how someone will, how long someone will live, how well, you know, how, whether or not they'll develop a chronic, all that stuff. And at the end of the day, for me, it's like, we have to, we have to recognize that every single person deserves to live a life free from bigotry and discrimination regardless yes. of size we have to decouple weight from health um, because at the end of the day we're not going to change people's weight right like it's less than one percent let's right. not focus on that um, let's just accept people where they're at. And then the other thing that's great is when we decouple weight from health, we create this opportunity to be like, okay, well, so what do we know actually helps every single person live better? We know that if they have a community that supports them, yep. they'll live a better life. We know that if they have access to clean water, if they have access to trees and running around and jumping around, right, we know that that will also help them. And so how do we, how do we kind of move forward without making this sort of giving fat people a death sentence um, and just saying like, you know, at the end of the day, we all have the capacity to thrive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Virgie, I could talk to you all day and then some. Um, and <laughs> we are out of time, unfortunately, because we didn't even get into your amazing program, Babe Camp, which helps women finally break up with their diets and embrace themselves. Mm. We didn't even get to your new book, which is aimed at teens and young girls, helping them to absolutely love themselves. I, I just have a feeling you're going to be back on the pod sometime soon. Um, <laughs> But before I let you go, uh, I would love to go through some lightning round questions with you. So yes. what is your number one strength? Ooh. Um, I'm going to say um, I'm really good at taking huge concepts uh -huh. and making them easy to understand. I feel like I that's, that's my number true. one strength. Yeah. And I would also argue joy. You are so oh, full of you. life and so full of joy. Your Instagram feed makes me just happy, happy, happy um, oh, all of good. the time. And just to see you exude joy and to fully own who you are is super mm. inspiring. What is the Thank thing that you. you struggle with? Ooh. I mean, I think I struggle with... Hmm... Yeah, God, there's so many ways that that answer could go. I guess the one that I'm thinking of is like truly believing that I'm like a good person, like yeah. to the core. Yeah. 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 I, <laughs> I know I struggle. My, my deepest struggle is just wor really worrying. Like, am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I thin mm. enough? Am I, am I, am I successful enough? Am I, is it enough? Um, so, but I think you're a good person. So, I don't think you're a good person. If you could say one word to a younger version of yourself, what would it be? Hmm. The word that came to mind was love. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Love always wins. Absolutely. <laughs> What keeps you up at night? 
Mm, um, I mean, lately, I feel like what keeps me up at night is this sense that we have access to like global thriving, I believe, and we're mm-hmm. like nowhere near it. And I'm just, and I'm just sort of confused. Um, yeah. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> yeah, it's like we have all these resources, but only these people get them. The yes. Oh my stars, yes. you are so right. Um, who has been your greatest inspiration? gosh I mean I think like that could go a lot of different ways but I'm thinking of um James Baldwin he's uh-huh. probably my biggest like literary intellectual influence oh, wow. yeah okay yeah last question you ready for it here we go mm-hmm. God to you is um Whoa. I mean, I guess I'm thinking, I'm thinking about like the ocean and trees and stuff. So Mm -hmm. I guess it's like, it's like that ability to connect to every single thing that has ever been and ever will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Virgie Tovar, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Go and pick up a copy of her new book, Everywhere That Books Are Sold. Thank you so much for being on the pod. Yeah, thank you. My next guest today is Komal Pandya. I love how when she sent in her her bio to me, she said she is a successful pharmacist because this grossly underestimates her skills as a pharmacist. I graduated uh, pharmacy school with Comal. We both got our doctorates in pharmacy from the University of California, San Francisco. She then went on to complete two years of completely badass residency, first year in pharmacy practice and then in critical care specialty residency. She now practices in the cardiothoracic intensive care unit at the University of Kentucky where she completed her residencies and she takes care of the absolute sickest of the sick patients in the state of Kentucky and it is an honor to learn from her and to call her one of my absolute dearest friends in the entire world. I wanted to talk to Komal today because she is a first generation born in the United States. Her family is from India and she knows firsthand how working through disconnects between what she knew she needed in her life and the cultural expectations of what her family expected from her was really tough. Throughout all of it, Komal has exerted herself, been fully actualized as her own woman, yet maintained a great, loving, meaningful, and mutually supportive relationship with her family, which I don't know that everyone is able to do. So here's to you, Komal, my dear friend, and your journey of radical self-acceptance. So let's dive right in. Tell us about the problem, the disconnects that you had between what you wanted to do with your life and what basically everyone in your family expected you to do. Sure. Um, well, like you said, I had, I've always had, and I continue to have a, a wonderful relationship with both of my parents and my sibling. Um, and I think we were always on the same page with actually a lot of things. Um, my father and mother were both very much interested in raising me to be empowered and self-sufficient. Um, and to make my own way in the world and all of that. And so whether it was education or any sort of additional training or anything, it was never a, why would you want to do that? It's keep going, keep going. And so on that front, at least in my life, I always had a wonderful support system, um, which was a powerful force in my life. I think it was more on the personal side that there was a bit of a dis connect. And um, it's almost interesting because I was still, you know, raised Hindu and there were very traditional aspects of my upbringing as well. And so 
I think for a long while until probably I was 21, 22, I thought that the traditional things were what I wanted because mm -hmm. it was what I was raised around and it was what I was, what I knew and what I was comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, and then right around then was when I left home, um, probably the furthest distance ever, which was moving to San Francisco from Southern California for pharmacy school. And then further then for residency afterwards to Lexington, Kentucky. And I think um, having that disconnect, having that physical distance sort of allowed me to explore myself outside of the norms of the way that I was raised. And so while at that time I was like, sure, I guess I wouldn't mind being introduced to guys by my family because that was the norm. Of course yeah. I want to get married because that's what, that's what I've always known and had around me and that's what previous generations have done. Um, and then the concept of living a different way, um, I think gradually came to be something that I knew and something that rang true for me kind of mm -hmm. later on in life. Um, so, so you moved away from home and you get to pharmacy school where a lot of us that have been more rebellious than you probably were <laughs> growing up, um, we were kind of to the point that, and, and also I think for me, not being raised in a cultural tradition where it is 100% normal for your family to set you up on dates of yes. potential suitors that they think are right for you. Yes. I remember watching you go through all these <laughs> yes. dates no. and just be like, do you like him? And you're like, no. Do you like him? <laughs> no. Do you like this guy? <laughs> no. But I was so proud of you even then because you had the wherewithal to know that you didn't like these guys. No, and it was always that blend of, I knew that I didn't like it time and time again, but I can sit here now, and if I have this conversation with my parents, say because I explored it, that I'm confident in my decision that it's not for me. Yeah. Um, that's what rang true for me. Um, people may know themselves better than I did at that age and more power to you, but I didn't, and I had to sort of have, have those missteps and see for myself that it wasn't for me. So along your journey, you have sought out guidance, mentors, um, resources for yourself to help empower yourself and, and maybe even, I mean, I can't even imagine what I, some of your conversations with your parents were like when you first came to the conclusion of this is not the woman that I am and I have to tell you this because I always knew one of the things I've always loved about your parents is you always had the confidence that they loved you enough that you could tell them anything. But before you got to that empowered point, what resources did you seek out? What guidance did you seek? What mentorship did you receive? Sure. Um, so it, starting out, I think it was a lot of the friends that I surrounded myself with. Um, I'm not the person that has a um, hundred close friends, but there's certainly that tight knit group that I can really let my guard down and speak my mind. Um, you obviously being one of them, um, but um, they really kind of helped guide me and kind of assure me because they knew me on a different wavelength, but with equal depth that my family did. And both forces in my life, um, I knew loved me, cared about me and wanted me to have what I wanted in life. Um, and I think from that, it just sort of solidified that I'm not off base, that what I was wanting rang true um, and made me feel confident in what I wanted. Um, mm -hmm. I think where I really kind of struggled and it took me some time to find my path is that in every respect, I felt like I could open up to my parents. But this one, for some reason, was a roadblock for me. Yeah. Um, and I would say that the time, like there was a time period where not just with my parents, but with some extended family, I did have kind of a turbulent relationship because I had this mental roadblock of, can I say this to them? Like somehow mm -hmm. that respect undertone of elders, that just that that sort of, it became a roadblock of, can I open up? And I think that that led to a lot of butting between, or head butting between my family and I. Um, uh. And at that time, I wanted to blame them. And I did in my own mind. I'm like, why don't they understand? How come they're not understanding like what my, what I'm thinking or blah, blah, blah. But then I realized in hindsight that I, they don't know because I'm not being direct 
enough. And that was something that I realized that I think was a global communication thing and roadblock for me just out of respect for people around me. And that was something that I actually ended up seeking a therapist to kind of work through being able to speak my truth and some of the thought work I kind of did with him that really helped me overcome where finally, probably maybe three, four years ago, I was able to sit down, especially with my father. My mom kind of got it. My dad and I have always been close, which means when something like this comes up, it was always going to be more challenging to communicate it with him. And I just finally said, listen, I don't want these things. Lord knows in five, five years it may change, but I know right now I don't want these things in my life. Right. Um, And I think that I cannot stress enough that my therapist and I continue to have a fantastic relationship and I'm so thankful for his role in my life, but he really kind of helped me speak my truth. And the funny thing is my dad was so appreciative of that, um, that he finally, it's the pressure from him and the continued questioning was from a place of wanting to get me to where I wanted to go. Mm. Now that he knew that I didn't want to necessarily get there, it was almost a sense of relief for him. Yeah. And and I think that you faced what so many women face, which is that that horrible feeling where the words are just like right here yep. in your throat. And you mm-hmm. are honestly, you're desperate to tell your your friends, your family, your loved ones what's on your mind. But if you've never done it, it becomes very scary. And I think the other thing that you said that's really important is that once you actually just laid it out there, got it on the table, it was a relief for everyone involved. Um, I don't think that that's the case for every single person's journey, but it's a credit to your parents Um, because, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of women do get in the position where they just go, if my family is this toxic for me and they're forcing me to do things that I don't want to do, how do you establish those boundaries? And so, you know, you, you had a, a great path in that your parents were open, even though your path was not easy. It wasn't easy for you to get there. I mean, what do you think some of the biggest obstacles that you faced were? In, in all honesty, like I think when I was in the thick of it and my frustrations were at its peak, I projected that my frustrations were with my family. And I think now in hindsight, I can reflect back and say, no, my frustrations were with me and myself and my own mental block um, to be able to open up and speak my truth. Like you said, it was just caught here and I would hint and I would drop these little hints, but I would never just outright say like, this is what I want. This is what I need. Um, and, yeah. and get it out there. Um, and I, I was the biggest at the end, really. Really? You think mm-hmm. you were the I biggest I think I was. I, not I think. I know that I was. Well, I, I think a lot of women do that same passive aggressive crap that you did, you know, you're like, this is my dad's fault. This is what he wants. This is what my mom wants. This is what's expected of me. This is what my aunties tell me that I'm supposed to do. But really and truly, and so then you're, you're saying all of those lies to yourself. And then when you do drop a hint of like, no, I don't want to go on a date this weekend or whatever it is, that expectation of like, oh yeah, they should just get this is, is not true. Oh, Um, exactly. And if I say, oh, not this weekend, then the implication is there that next weekend or the following weekend or whatever, there were doors left open because I wasn't speaking my truth. So what advice would you give to women who are in the same situation? Because I think that some women never break this cycle. You know, they're 65 years old going like, what the heck just happened with my life? How would, you know, if you were to look back on your, your 20 year old self, how would you approach this differently? I think the, the disconnect in my own head was that just because I speak my truth, that that was going to somehow be disrespectful no matter what I did. And I think that there is a way to speak your truth and be mature and respectful and not 
break those relationships. You may need to stew on it. You may need to write it out. Um, but just because you, what you want out of life is different and you're afraid of making somebody else angry, well, number one, you're, it's not your responsibility to make everybody in your life happy. That's on themselves. Um, but number two, just because you want to speak the truth doesn't mean, I mean, don't, you don't have to be insulting. You don't have, you can do it in a, in a loving manner. Um, and I would say, you know, if you, you don't necessarily have to lash it out, it can be a conversation that you kind of plan for in your own head, um, so that you can kind of make sure you speak your piece in, in a loving, respectful way, both to yourself and who you need to have that conversation with. So when you were in therapy, what were some of like the tangible tools that you went through with your therapist that helped you prepare for these conversations? Um, I think one of the things where there were all these perceptions in my head about what would go wrong if somehow I spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than just keeping those at the surface level, he made me each and every one of those scenarios that I had made up in my head of what catastrophe would happen. We saw through, we talked mm. through like really what's the worst that's going to happen. And then what, and then what, okay. So we've solved that. What else could go wrong? Okay. So what, and then what, and I think overcoming those, what ifs, which cripple me, um, mm -hmm. I have underlying anxiety and that's why, and that's one of the manifestations is there's always the what ifs and um, he made me see them through. And, and, and by the time that there was nothing left, it's like, well, I guess I'm having a crucial conversation. <laughs> and, I think that was the most helpful. And I think crucial conversations, you know, this is a book that I read a long time ago when I had gotten just lost in so much of my own internal anger that I, I couldn't have a conversation with that many people and crucial conversations you know everybody's like oh no we're gonna have a fight uh -huh. no, that's not what you, it is that's not what it is when you actually go into it with like I need to say this it needs to be said finding that that shared pool of mutual meaning where you're both speaking the same language and even in pharmacy school we learned clarification techniques that we were taught to use on our patients, but we were never taught to use them with our friends and family, which no. is like, imagine if we had gone through our teenage years and just like, it sounds like what you're saying is this, did I right. hear that correctly? Um, and so have there been any lingering struggles since you've really gotten this out on the table and said for the time being, marching down the path that's been expected of me my whole life, you know, have there been any lingering struggles or do you think that your, your parents mourn for the loss of expectation from you? I, th if they are, they haven't really said it to me. Um, I think they're like, I, I had mentioned before, I think because, because I wasn't communicating, our relationship was strained for a period of time. And I think they're, at least what I'm getting from them is that I think we're all so happy to have such a solid relationship again, that it hasn't been so much of an issue. But I also think it's my own perception of things that have changed. Does that mean that my dad doesn't ask me questions sometimes? No, that's not the case. It's just how I respond to it and how I perceive it. Um, is very different. And I think that that's been beneficial because I know, recognize in my heart that it's coming from a place of really wanting to know me as an adult and as a woman and not wanting to tell me what to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, I think perception is key there. I think my old self probably would have internally blown up at any sort of question about yeah. any things regarding my personal life. Um, but I just perceive them very different. I perceive them very positively because I have the confidence to respond and not be embarrassed by what it is that I want to do and what I want to say. Oh, that's really profound. You know, cause your dad may be saying the same thing that he said to you for years and years, which is how Absolutely. is your dating life? How are you seeing anyone? But you've broken up with the idea that his intention is solely for mm -hmm. you to get married and have children and all of those things. That's that's yep. really brilliant, Komal. So, well, I really want to thank you. Um, today, everybody, we're recording on March the 25th. We are right in the middle of 
the upswing and still as a nation are feeling the sense of impending doom um, that it may or may not be coming our way from the coronavirus. And as I said, my dear friend Komal is absolutely in the trenches taking care of some very sick people. So I thank you for your service to the country, to the state of Kentucky, to patients everywhere. And I just I'm so proud of you, my friend. I really, really am. You have just- Proud of you too. It's been an honor and a joy to blossom alongside you and to have somebody who helps me to be better and me to be more compassionate and me to listen more and just, I love you. Thanks for being on love the show. Love you too. All right, Bye. take care. Bye. Do you feel overwhelmed by the constant pressure to look right, act right, and be perfect? Yep, as we have heard from today's guests, lots of women feel the exact same way. But let me tell you something, friends. What is more important than listening to everyone else's opinions about who you are and who you're supposed to be? It is much more important that you exert your own personal power and make decisions for yourself. I have a free download for you. It's a seven step guide that will teach you how to cut through confusion and decide what is right for you in your life. You will learn how to practice self care, serve a greater purpose, tap into your intuition and listen to your body. To download the free ebook, all you have to do is head to www.lindsayelmore.com slash ebook. Like I said, it's totally free. Head to www.lindsayelmore.com slash ebook and download a seven step guide to making decisions that honor your inner voice, optimize your health and serve your highest purpose. For the first time in history, an animated film that celebrates the styling of black hair won an Academy Award for best animated short. Too often, styles of black hair are used as the basis of discrimination. High school students are told that they must cut dreadlocks in order to walk at graduation. Cornrows are banned at certain bars and restaurants. And ethnic hair care products are segregated to a separate aisle than products marketed to white people. Furthermore, ethnic hair care products, especially those for significantly textured hair and natural curls, are laden with toxins such as endocrine disruptors. The representation of black hair in the media is more important than ever, and Dana Mott is the author of Kinky Locks. She is a licensed esthetician and an advocate for natural care for curly hair. Dana Mott, welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you because the role that the media plays in how we see ourselves in society is critically important. What do you see as the risks when television, movies, and magazines are all skewed to people who look the same, especially especially when we're talking about the representation of women. And what shifts do you think occur when we do see adequate representation? Definitely say when I look at when I grew up, you know, a lot of times you don't see um, yourself. You might see the straight hair and you might see lighter skin and things like that. And over time, what I found it did is even though I didn't realize it, it made you want to change yourself to mm. fit in. Mm -hmm. it and now as we're slowly making that transition, slowly seeing um, an evolution of it, people are accepting more of themselves and they're able to express who they are. So for me, I think of like my daughter. So my daughter is mm -hmm. 10 years old. Um, yep. and one of the biggest things for me in my movement was because I saw her in myself and I wanted her to have a different view um, mm -hmm. because, again, for me growing up, even if I did see myself, the hair was always straight. Right. Uh -huh. I, I didn't even know how to do my own hair. Because oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? My whole life, I always went to the beauty salon. Um, I actually have a sister that is a hairstylist. Um, and so she would always do my hair. Like the only time in between I would do it, I would straighten it. I didn't know how to manage my own hair. And so mm -hmm. when 
the media uh, perpetuates these things, um, really it's going to have an effect on our own self-esteem. It's going to have an effect on our generations. Um, and so for me, I knew that we have to change that. We have to transition. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. to put more positive things into our children um, so they can love who they are. Yes. And, and I also think that it's not just about children not seeing themselves. I think that there are outright misrepresentations of genuinely how black people care for their hair. I was watching an episode of The Outsider the other day, which stars the absolutely brilliant Cynthia Erivo. And in the show, she's wearing a weave. And there is a scene where she is in the bathtub and she just goes underwater. And I'm like, since I am am lucky enough to have had friends who have taught me about these things, and then I also live with my partner who has dreadlocks, I just watched that and I was like, no one would ever do that. That's like, so that true. is not how you care for that kind of hair. Um, so... In listening to my friends who have very textured or very curly hair, one of the downsides about styling your hair is that you have to try a lot of products. The products are potentially toxic. They may or may not work. They're expensive. It's hard to select what the right product is. So if someone is like you and did not know how to style their own textured hair, or if someone is struggling to manage their child's curly hair, what are your top tips for knowing where to start to care for your hair naturally without spending a fortune on products that you may or may not like? So I definitely will say that's where um, the book that I wrote actually comes in play. Um, I do feel like, honestly, there's a lot of stuff in your kitchen that would be amazing for your hair. Oh, wow. Um, Yes. And I actually say start there because the other huge thing that I would notice is because we have textured hair, then we all got put in this same box. Uh Well, the reality is, the density of my hair might be different than the person over here. And Mm -hmm. my porosity might be different than the person over here. And so what works for this person's hair is terrible for my hair over here. Um, Wow. I didn't even, I didn't even know that you had to consider this kind of thing about hair. So you said the density of the hair texture, as well as the porosity. So I'm assuming that's maybe how much water or fat the hair follicle lets in. Absolutely. Yep. So for me, I'll use myself as an example. My hair is super, super dense, which in every square foot there or square inch in my head, um, there's tons of hair, right? Mm -hmm. So I would need to use more product because I have more hairs in those little areas. My porosity, I have a very low porosity, which Mm -hmm. means it's hard for each one of my hairs to actually absorb the hydration and moisture in okay. order for my hair to stay healthy, right? Mm-hmm. So when I know that about my hair, now I'm going to need to use and utilize things that are going to increase the porosity and increase my hair follicles' abilities to hold on to those things. You can do that? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, okay. So, I, I have so many questions here. So let's take this back. You said there are lots of things in the kitchen that you can use. So what are your maybe like top two things that you think most people would have hanging around the house that might help to nourish their hair? So I would say one aloe vera. I love, love, love aloe vera gel and juice. Okay. Um, I use a lot in my hair as well as flaxseed. Okay. Okay. All right. It's flaxseed oil and aloe vera. So two completely different products. Tell us how these two products help to nourish hair. Yes. So the aloe vera, the one nice thing about aloe vera um, is it is a great humectant. Um, And so when you put it in your hair follicles, it actually helps. It's almost like a magnet. So it's going to try to absorb all of those things. So again, using myself, because I have low porosity, I need an extra agent that's going to help hold on to the stuff. So it's not just rinsing out my hair or, you know, not really getting into each one of those follicles. 
Yes. Okay. So yeah, humectants are those kinds of molecules that absorb additional uh, moisture. Mm -hmm. So it stands to reason you would start out with your aloe vera and then follow it up with your flaxseed oil. Is that how you do it? Absolutely. You got it. You got it. Yep. yep. And I have even t taken like, so one of the recipes in my book, I actually have taken flax seeds and I will boil them and then mm -hmm. I separate it out and it makes a gel. Okay. Yep. Very interesting. Okay. And so what are your top tips for caring for your child's hair, you know, and how do you train younger girls to know how to care for their own hair? So for me, and, and I'll use my daughter, um, the biggest things that I do is it's maintaining in between as well. So I feel like growing up, I was always told like water, no, like stay away from water, like that's gonna mess <laughs> your hair and things like that. Well, the reality is you need the water to drive the oils. You need the water in order to get better absorption. So I actually, every single night, I actually will wet down my daughter's hair so mm -hmm. that while she sleeps, her moisture and everything can kind of absorb into her hair. Um, and then I also will kind of detangle it or separate it out. That way it doesn't get really matted or while she's sleeping um, and things like that. But I want all of those good moisture and hydration to get into each one of her hair follicles so that she can get better absorption. And then it's going to be easier for me to manage during the day. Yeah, easier to detangle when it's got the moisture in the hair. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for being here today. I hope everyone who is working with natural hair, textured hair, or um, has a child with hair that is a bit more challenging to manage will go pick up a copy of Kinky Locks because there are better options for caring for textured hair. The Lindsay Elmore Show is written and produced by me, Lindsay Elmore. Show segments are produced by Sue Procco and Kelsey Lorman. Production design, sound design, and editing is by Jive Media. If you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast, send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com. And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram at lindsayelmoreshow. This helps us bring the pod to more people.